Hello and welcome to New Filmmakers Los Angeles. I am delighted to be joined by the very talented John Alston uh, with his fantastic movie, Augustus. Uh, but for those that haven't seen it, let's take a look at a clip. Today I am reborn in the fire of abolition as the enemy of slavery. And until America can face its original sin, Augustus, I will never die. Uh, John, I'm, I'm, this is, this is great. We're so close, but yet so far, uh, but I'm glad we get to do this virtually. Um, thanks man for your bringing your film to us. And, and we're so grateful you brought such a brilliant a uh, story to, to us at New Filmmakers LA. But for those that haven't seen it, tell us a, a brief synopsis of your film. You know, first of all, Danny, thank you so much for having me, having Augustus. Um, as I've, I've told several people that New Filmmakers Los Angeles has been the best experience I've had in the uh, festival circuit thus far. And uh, I really think that you guys not only just champion the filmmaker, but you actually give us opportunities beyond this film and beyond this festival. So, you know, I appreciate that. I haven't seen it much in this industry. This industry does not care, you know, unless you're ready to give them something they can make money off of immediately. And so you guys stand out, uh, you know, amongst the stars uh, and in all of Los Angeles and Hollywood. So I appreciate you. Oh, and you. talking about Augustus, um, you know, on a quick surface level, it's a genre bending Frederick Douglass origin story, so to speak, right? Um, but we do explore a lot of very interesting themes uh, and we shot the film in 2019, um, you know, and because, you know, if you're thinking about what some of the things that we talked about as far as inequality and, 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 and the struggles that, you know, someone of the era of Frederick Douglass dealt with and, and comparing those to the things that some people, you know, especially black males deal with today. Uh, we shot this in 2019, this is, but this is ongoing for us, right? For, for Ian Day, who's a writer and the lead actor in the film. Uh, coming together to make this thing happen. But then 2020 happened in the summer of 2020, which, you know, set the world on fire. Um, and so in the midst of that, to kind of bring the film home, we added the documentary footage that showed, you know, the statue of Frederick Douglass being destroyed, uh, that talked about, you know, um, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and things of that nature, and uh, kind of an homage to the people that we've lost to um, useless uh, uh, police violence. Yeah. I I mean, I mean, God, I'm, I'm just well enough just just going reflecting over your film again. I mean, it, it, it was I mean, it's firstly, you've got a, a mesmerizing uh, vision of incorporating uh, these these these, you know, today and and, and the past and, and, and the unfortunate, uh, you know, core of where things are still existing today. And I just, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's really hard to sort of you know, even ask this question because it's kind of obvious, but where did the inspiration come for you in, in deciding to take this very prominent moment in history and kind of entwining it with today? I mean, of course, it may seem obvious why you may be creative. What, what, when was the moment when you're like, I, I need to kind of resonate the, these stories together? You know, um, for me personally, going all the way back to August 9th of 2014 uh, and the death of Michael Brown, and uh, I was drafted uh, into the NFL by the St. Louis Rams. And so I lived in St. Louis in and out for about 10 years. And where Michael Brown was, was, was killed uh, is literally about nine minutes from where I live downtown. And see what people don't really understand is that Ferguson, Missouri is, you know, it's a middle-class neighborhood. It's not Fallujah, it's not the hood. It's not, you know, some place where you'd be really scared to go in, you know, it used to be a heavily white area and then you had a little bit of white flight and then you had blacks moving in, but it's still a middle class neighborhood. So when Michael, the incident with Darren Wilson and Michael Brown took place, Michael Brown's body lay in the street in the middle of the summer, you know, for four and a half hours. Any community would be outraged by this, right? And so for the black community of Ferguson, Missouri, who had been dealing with, you know, unjust police practices, where they were basically, you know, using tickets and all these other things to raise revenues uh, for the city. And they were mostly taking black passengers, I mean, black people uh, for jaywalking, et cetera, et cetera, taillights, all these sorts of things. People going to jail for not being paying, paying these fines or being able to pay these fines. Uh, that was a, a step too far. You know, you, you take so much oppression, you take so much disrespect. And then on top of that, you dishonor the dead. 
And yeah. so that's how we know about it. It grew. There was a, it became viral. This is such an outrage. And even for me, living on the ground, you know, I, I've grown up in a. Um, in, I always say I've grown up in two worlds. I, you know, I I'm, didn't grow up with money, and I went to private school by the grace of my grandmother and my mother and the sacrifices of my family to scrape a couple thousand bucks to send me to Catholic school in Louisiana. And so I got to experience how you know uh, people who were different from me lived. Uh, and knowing how I did come up and how I lived and, 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 and you know, starting from there in Bastrop, Louisiana, really, really poor. And then to Shreveport and the Catholic school and then the Stanford University uh, to the NFL, the USC. And I've lived in Florida, St. Louis. I've lived in New York City uh, on Barclay and Tribeca. I've lived uh, in San Francisco, like I said, Palo Alto. And now I'm in Los Angeles. And I, I guess I've seen so much of the gamut of the United States of America. So I really have a strong place to, to, to say, okay, I know what inequality looks like, right? And I know what um, what resources are lacking. And I can tell you the people, the people um, we're not as different as we'd like to be told that we are. You know, the truth be told is most of uh, our country is just simply manipulated by a, a, a few who yeah. really, really seek to gain. We're all, we're all alike. And we, and, and, and generally speaking, I think people do love each other and want to love each other. You know what I mean? I can't tell you how many people I went to high school with and from Louisiana, who we do actively say, hey, look, I love you, friend. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And who, who support me on my journey to this day. And it doesn't matter what race they are. You know what I mean? Uh, but we, we, we will hear so many narratives that tell us that, that the world is different and it looks different. And it's not necessarily true. That's just a few people trying to really, really gain uh, and game the system. So uh, that's where I kind of wear this hat to stay woke. It looks like COVID. It's funny. Yeah. But that Michael Brown incident was one that really opened my eyes mm. to these things. And so in 2019, Ayanda Howell, who wrote the original screenplay, came to me with this. I worked with him at USC and I looked at the ideas and I said, that's it. You know what I mean? I said, that's how you do it, right? Because I firmly believe at when, the moment that I did kind of start waking up, I did start to research history and start to understand that systemic injustices rooted in the DNA of our country, right? These injustices have to be repaired for us to continue to move on, move on so that we can communicate around them, right? And so when I started to see this paralleling, jumping back and forth, and yeah, there's some things to get right, but I said, this is brilliant. And, I, and this had to be told. It just struck me in my heart and it continues to do so to this day. And I don't think I'm going to stop until more and more people can see, see this and share our story. And then the next film is, you know, and the next film. And so uh, that would have been, it's, it's, so it's all kind of intertwined. The moment I saw this story, the moment I, I read the original opening, uh, which paralleled, you know, Frederick Douglass witnessing Trayvon Martin's death, which we then broke, made it personal to, to Frederick Douglass that it's his son. That's an allegor allegory. It's allegorical to Trayvon Martin's death. Said this has to be, this has to be done. We have to see this. And that was the moment. John, you're, you're, I mean, you're amazing. I'm so glad that we, you know, and the NFL, we're lucky to have you. We're lucky to have you in entertainment um, because you have a, a, a tremendous vision. And, and not only that, you really pinpoint um, such, you know, such important, meticulous subjects, its nuances, its connectivity, it's everything. And, you know, we can never stop talking about, um, you know, accountability and, and, and we can never stop educate and we can never stop being better we can never stop loving and growing and understanding and building and one of the things that i really loved in the way that you just you know brought the film to us is that you took us right there like i was you know you took us right in there you took us really into the hearts of your characters the tremendous actors um and and you know i i just thought your, your visionary the way it was shot everything was just it was a wonderful cinematic experience as hard as it was to watch but a very important a film to watch when you're working with your actors and you know the stakes are high these are very intense real scenes and it's happening and i also there's the extra layer as well of just the unfortunate situation that horrible things are still happening to this day and how that must resonate uh you know with a black man and and playing this acting role of as just as this situation you know from history to present day, how do you work with your actors? In oh man, you know, I will start with just saying we were very blessed and very fortunate. Um, you know, this was a very unique and collaborative experience for me personally because I had never 
worked with an actor in a, in a creative capacity, you know, you know, working with INDA on the screenplay, um, you know, honing those things in, and then also, you know, as an actor and as a, as a producer as well. And so I wanted to challenge myself, you know, to get those perspectives and, and build that union. Uh, I firmly believe in collaboration, right? Um, we were very, very fortunate to have uh, an amazing cinematographer in Matt Edwards, right? Okay. I mean, he, the guy is, the guy is, he's a genius. You know what I mean? He really is. Um, and so when we were workshopping that script to honing it in after I had already written it, and we sent it, I sent it to Matt. You know, a lot of people may not try to get the feedback from the, the cinematographer or anyone else, but I like to hear the feedback from what I would consider my general audience before I even get into the process of shooting this thing, because I can hear the note underneath the note underneath the note. Right? Yeah. And if I hear the things going on consistently, right, then I know I need to fix this, I need to rectify this, right? And then, so when, by the time that we got there, I ended, uh, had a relationship with Michelle Michinor, who was just absolutely phenomenal. You know, she's on a television show now, again, uh, and Patrick Cage, I worked with on All American, and I just knew he was a great guy, and I knew who he was. We brought in Chris Ryan, I played football with him at, at, at Stanford, you know, uh, he plays one of the Finch brothers. He's phenomenal on screen, and then we were able to cast. But working with these actors, um, you know, I've always been a captain in sport. Um, and one of the reasons why is because I can look at an individual and I understand what motivates that individual. Yeah. And that's, that's the communication point where I start, right? I say, what, who do they see themselves as? Who do they want to be? And what do they want to reflect? And the moment I get them to, to say that to me, then I, I just hold them accountable to that, yeah. right? And so then I, I listen to what their language is and I match my language with what their language is, right? And so then I can, and we can look at that screenplay, we can look at what they're trying to say and what they want to do. And then at that point, as, since I respect them as artists, it becomes my job to focus them in on where they want to go and hone that in, right? In a way that matches the overall scope of the, of the story that we're trying to tell, because yeah. it's my job also to see that from beginning to end, inside out, right? And yeah. I do work to do that, right? On multiple levels and layers. And so all we do is we just, we sit there, we communicate. One of the beautiful things that we did do um, was we, Michelle, uh, Ayane, and myself, there were multiple rehearsals. And in the, those rehearsals, we really crafted the midpoint scene between the two where they're talking. And um, Augustus is relaying um, his lack of uh, masculinity, feeling emasculated because he can't really provide for his family because he, he lost, something was taken from him, you know, his money. He asked her specifically, am I not a man? He tries to have sex with his wife. He can't. He can't get an erection, right? Because he is emasculated. So we, we wanted to show that on an emotional level and a physiological level, right? Because yeah. how, how much further can you go from where you want to be in your goal, right? Which is to be that man that provides for his family. Yeah. Right. Like, and that's everybody's dream. Yeah. Um, and at that point, right? That, that's where we're sitting. So we were able to come to that moment which I believe it was truth by the actors just living in those characters, which I thought is one of the most beautiful moments of the film. It was, I mean, it was amazing. And, and there, there was that, that moment, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, there is this sort of inbuilt, whether it's in our testosterone or whatever it is that we want to provide for our families, right? And, and we kind of put ourselves under intense pressure, but these are extreme circumstances and, and horrible circumstances that existed. and. You know, I thought you encapsulated that, you know, really, really well, because, you know, I, every hopefully good human being wants to provide for their family. But when they're given this horrible extra layer of, of life that they have to deal with, um, it, it, it's, it's horrendous. And it's, it's, it's deafening to someone's soul and, and their integrity and everything. And I thought that was really beautifully portrayed in, in, in the acting there as well. Um, Listen, I, I, I love the fact that like I, I, I love the fact that you were you know a fantastic NFL player and, and, and now a, a fantastic filmmaker. Uh, we wanted to have you in both careers, but what's the difference? Like, is, is there kind of a, a similar synergy or, or things that you've learned from, from having that career into this career? How has that kind of been for you? I tell you what, um, in some ways, in so many ways, actually, it's the same. Um, it was funny when I was working my first film, I worked with a phenomenal actor named Diogo Morgado who played Jesus and some God and mm -hmm. also in the Bible. Um, and Diogo is a very, you know, he's Portuguese, he's a star, he's an international Emmy Award winner. Um, he has a lot of deep insight. And it was just funny because he was an athlete as well growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we talked about it on set one day and he says to me, you know, 
actors are the athletes of emotion. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And I, and as a director, I'm your coach. You know what I mean? And so I thought that was just a really phenomenal bond that we kind of built and really something that I take away uh, yeah. as I approach this craft. And I try to take some of the, the, the lessons that I learned about consistency, discipline, and work and study and sport, apply that to this. And so you're going to hear a lot from me. You know what I mean? Because I, I have the goals. I have the, the, the vision boards. You know, I've written them out. I know where I'm going. And uh, there's a reason why I want to get there, though. And that's the thing. The only difference, really, at this point is that I can do this till I'm 90, till I'm dead. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my yeah, story is not long, long, right? <laughs> well, I did it for five years. So that, that, that's yeah. the thing that, that, that helped this. How did you, I mean, I think it was, I think it was important and that you put it in there. I couldn't imagine without of it now, but the fact you were planning to make this film before and then how, how was that effective? Because obviously, goodness me, it was, it was an unreal summer last year. And, and, you know, sadly that footage was from very recent times. Well, you know, it's great to listen to the people in our lives as filmmakers. That was something that came about originally as my brother, like talking to my brother. And he said, this is a really powerful film. He's like, it would be very, and he's a very creative guy too. Uh, he has a, 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 a cannabis company called uh, James Henry. And, um, you know, he came from the engineer, an engineering background. He watched the film, he's very, you know, and he says to me, you know, it'd be interesting if we could put something or dealt with something with the names of, of the people that we've lost in this, it's the names. And, and, you know, when you're exhausted from making a film like this, it's independent, you know, trying to come with the money. It's a period piece, this is a very, very hard film to make, right? Very, very hard film to edit and craft. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a great team. And um, I was also exhausted from this world, you know, COVID and racism and all the conversations people wanted to have at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was reluctant at first. And then it just hit me and he, it said to me, he's right. You know, and, and I started to study a little bit more and I watched Spike Lee films, mm -hmm. right? And it made so much sense to me because why does Spike do this? Because it, it, it cements the film as relevant yeah. it's it, it may seem overt or on the nose at first but it's, it's it is a necessary part of stories like this because audiences take away from this and it, it all becomes a, a perfect association in rhythm and so that was the thing to hit and I, and I found this really talented guy named steve biggert um who's done some really great stuff and um he helped craft that final montage you know, and it, it was just really, really emotionally effective. And, yeah. you know, I thought that it was necessary. Um, I believe that it came, kind of gave the film a little bit more gravitas, like a greater gravitas and greater weight. And uh, that was it. it. It came about in August of 2020 is actually when we completed that. Well, I, th I think, um, you know, you know, your film is, 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 and I'm, I'm not the only one that's going to feel this way, but it's going to sit with me forever. You know, it's going to be forever. And I think one of the things that obviously we, we invigorate into last year as well is, is, you know, say her name, say his name. And, you know, that your film will forever, you know, Augustus, it will forever be there and, 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 and be in our hearts where we can hopefully learn and enhance and, and show accountability for what happened then to what happens today. And I think, that's what's so amazing about your film is that it needs to be seen by, you know, not just locally, globally, you know, a, a, a global awareness. And, um, you know, I'm just curious, you know, uh, now that you've made it, like, what did you kind of want your audience to take from it? Uh, you know, the, the equality, that's it. You know, the, we, make the, we make the notion, okay, it's always the same. I always say, look, if Dr. Martin Luther King had a dream, we were living Frederick Douglass's nightmare, right? And like you said, that's embodied by the destruction of the statue of Frederick Douglass uh, in July of, of 2020, right? Because of a speech that he gave pre-Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so looking at that, you say, hey, look, if we don't know our past, we don't know our future. You know what I mean? We can't, we can't, if we don't repair the things that were done in the past, acknowledge them, right? We can't fix, we can't move forward. Because yeah. it's always the same because we're reverberating this trauma. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think that there was a large awakening last summer. It was very important for us, which allowed for these conversations, which allows for a film like Augustus to, be, to, 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 to spread, right? And to be seen and be communicated about. And so um, that's really what, what I want the audience to take away is ultimately. And then also 
the most beautiful part about last summer was that it's not just black and brown people who are taking to the streets. If you, you know, if you feel any injustice, just like Dr. Martin Luther King said, like injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere, right? Um, take to the streets, stand up, say something, speak out and tell your truth. That is Augustus' story. Speak out and tell your truth. Uh. John, I mean, listen, I could, we could just, it's like a TED talk with you. I could just listen to you all day. You're amazing. You're so uh, wonderfully inspiring. I really appreciate you. I, I am, I am curious because I, you know, I, I've really, I, I just love your vision in, in your work. And I, I'm just curious, what is next for you? What are you next working on? So I recently adapted uh, the Bruce Franks Jr. story. Um, there was a, a an Oscar nominated short documentary by Sarika Mundra and Sunny Khan called St. Louis Superman. And uh, my heart's in St. Louis. I know Bruce personally. I consider him family. His uncle is like my big brother. And um, I've adapted his story into a feature the narrative screenplay. Um, it's about, with Ron McCants, who's another writer from Missouri who also lives in Los Angeles. And a uh, very talented guy. And um, that story is an amazing story about a battle rapper, right, who uh, wasn't involved in politics, who then after the death of Michael Brown became a Ferguson activist and a leader. Right. And then he decided to run uh, for, for, for statewide office to challenge an incumbent uh, of the 78th district in, Street, in um, St. Louis for uh, the Missouri House of Representatives um, against Penny Hubbard, whom he lost originally from. And then they found out that she was rigging absentee ballots, challenged and won in a landslide. And in the midst, midst of that, like got a lot of regular, average, everyday folks involved and in, invested in politics and the political process. And mm-hmm. so when he got to um, the Missouri House of Representatives, he also got a bill passed against anti-youth uh, gun violence uh, in honor of his late brother who was slain uh, at the hands of a, you know, an Ill- illegal weapon when he was nine and Bruce was six years old. Um, uh, Christopher Harris Day became uh, a day in the state of Missouri as a result of this bill. And so Bruce's story is phenomenal. And even though you have all this stuff on the surface, these wonderful moves, it's not, hey, that's a movie. It's really an introspective character study about black masculinity and mental health, right? Yeah. Because he was dealing with survivor's guilt in the midst of this, because he witnessed his brother being killed, right? And everything that he'd grown up with. So sometimes this violence that we experience in the in 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 these really, really difficult communities um, and really disparaged communities, it does bring about this level of, of guilt and PTSD to yeah. individuals. And, and as minorities, oftentimes we don't talk about the necessities of mental health care. And so I want to tell that story you know, not on a, just on a social justice angle, but on an angle that says, look, you know, you, by taking care of yourself, right, that is the strength. And the beauty of St. Louis Superman is Bruce, when he was running for office and what he will always say is superheroes do two things. He says, they save people who don't want to be saved and they save people who don't know that they need to be saved. Mm-hmm. And he, ultimately for Bruce, he's the one that didn't know that he needed to be saved, mm. right? And so that is his journey in this story. And by saving himself, by taking care of himself, stepping down from the House of Representatives, taking care of his mental health, he becomes an example for his own son, you know, his own children, and many people who look up to him, and who now understand the necessity of mental health care. This is amazing, John. I mean, listen, you're going to save lives with this film. You know, you never know who you're going to touch, but it's going to it's going to touch a lot of people's hearts here and. You know, and again, having that freedom to talk about mental health as well, um, you know, amazing, amazing, John. I, I can't wait for your next film. Just just get to it because we need it. We need it. We need it in this world. We need the vision. Um, listen, I thank so much for bringing Augustus to us. It's been a, a joy to have you part of our film festival. And, and thanks for this wonderful conversation we got to share today. And just thank you for your, you know, your vision as a filmmaker. We, we, we need you in this industry and, and I'm so grateful for you. So thank you so much. Thank you all. I appreciate you.